Welcome to the Broker Growth Accelerator, where we discuss how real estate brokers can accelerate their growth by improving their agent recruiting and retention. I'm your host, Jim Turner, and today we'll discuss growth tactics with our special guest, who is a subject matter expert in the industry. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Jim Turner. I'm the CEO and co-founder of BrokerKit, and I'll be your host today. Today on the show, we're excited to have Paul Rich, an independent broker owner, who's joined us to talk about his experience growing his business. Paul, welcome to the Broker Growth Accelerator podcast. Thanks, Jim. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Well, let's just start out with um, a little bit of background. How long have you been in business, and how'd you get into running your own brokerage? Yeah, so I've been in real estate for the last 10 years. Uh, prior to the fall of 2021, I was a managing broker and was an, another independent brokerage. And uh, I made that decision to make the switch to have my own brokerage after growing that brokerage from it had an agent count of five agents at the time to 65, and we became a top 50 market share in our market. Uh, all the, that time that I was doing that, it was a very manual process, kind of relied on Google Calendar and um, my own memory, which worked most of the time. Um, and so I didn't have a system in place at that time. Now that I have my own independent brokerage, what I'm finding is that, of course, in a addition to doing all the recruiting and all the training in my office, I'm kind of doing everything, all of the day-to-day -day operations. So without a system uh, in place, recruiting has sort of fallen by the wayside. So I'm looking to grow that agent count. I did happen to come across BrokerKit as a customer as well. So I'm very excited about what uh, is offered through that system. And it's been great uh, to utilize that system to be much more systematic in what I do. Okay, sounds good. And so back to when you were the managing broker, um, how many agents did you start with and how many did you end up with there? And then maybe what, where are you in terms of agent count in, uh, you know, your new, uh, since you put hung out your own shingles, so to speak? You got it. So when I was brought on board, my job was to grow that brokerage. I started with five agents and then we grew it to 65. Um, while I was there in a, approximately a three-year period. And uh, I'm, my current office uh, location, there's a total of eight of us, myself plus seven other agents. Um, and that, uh, again, that's been in the last uh, about a year and a half. And so where do you want to be 12 months from now? So my goal is to get to uh, be very systematic about it, get to about 20 producing agents. Uh, and my medium goal is to be uh, at about 50 Okay. In the last, next two to three years. Okay, awesome. So tell me, what's the ideal um, profile for those agents that you're looking to bring on board and why? You bet. So, you know, it's it's been interesting having interviewed literally hundreds of agents over the last several years is that there's kind of a sweet spot there where, you know, we know that there's the 80-20 rule. 20% in any market are doing 80% of the business. That's not uh, not different here in the Las Vegas metro area. And so that sweet spot for me would be those who are producing, they're just looking to kind of take that next level. Uh, maybe five to 10 um, transactions a year. And they've just sort of sort of balanced out to that, you know, it, we, we know that the life uh, cycle of, a, of an agent that makes it after that five-year period, it does sort of taper off that we see years two and three, there's kind of a nice steady growth and then a s slow tapering and it just sort of hangs steady unless they make some changes. So that five to 10 transaction a year agent would be a great uh, fit because again, they, they've been kind of in that routine they they know the business. They've done enough transactions to where, um, you know, that learning curve isn't so steep. But yet they're they're anxious to take that next step in their business. So for me, that's kind of that ideal sweet spot. Okay, okay. Um, and here at Broker Kit, we definitely help people find those agents by the production. So um, that tends to work pretty well. And that's uh, you know kind of a near the range we hear. We hear a lot uh, kind of six to twelve. Um, up to, you know, 15, 6 to 15, different variations of that. It's pretty common. Um, so then without a, within those who, you know, kind of may, maybe you find those people, what um, additional kind of traits are you looking for in terms of, you know, personality, background, things like that, that you feel like will help them be maybe, um, you know, produce and be successful at, at, you know, kind of a higher level? 
and maybe that's and, and also be a culture fit. So um, beyond production, what, what are you looking for? Absolutely. In fact, um, you know, in, in many ways, while I'm targeting that production level, um, what you mentioned is actually even more important. What kind of a fit is that? What kind of a cultural fit is that? And so, you know, as I'm interviewing, the the big ticket item is, do they even have a business plan? Or, or do they have a business plan that, that they understand? You know, the most common, especially brand new licensees is, I want to be making six figures. Well, that doesn't that doesn't give you any indication of do they actually have a working business plan. So, so somebody that's that's given some forethought and some understanding of that this is their own business and they're actually growing it and we can be there to be a support system for them. And then for the cultural fit, we really emphasize giving back to our community and be, that kind of grassroots being tied into our community. And so, you know, we we do have a deep conversation about you know this is an independent brokerage and we're we are in a the second largest metro area in Nevada, and yet it's still a small town. And so as a result, we really focus on giving back to our community. And so those are kind of the two big traits that I look for. Do they, do they actually understand that this is their business and it is a business? It's not just a hobby. And then, um, you know, do, do they fit that culture of, you know, we – there's all kinds of avenues for success and, and recruiting agents and bringing agents on board. To me, having a you know a, a cash bar, a, a taco night, that's those are fun things, but that's not part of who we are. You know, day in and day out, we're about getting getting work done, producing, being successful, and giving back. Understood. So, what's the best way to find those folks? Like, um, what sources of recruiting leads do you have um, that you've leveraged to you know kind of find those ideal agents? So I'm kind of looking at, you know, I kind of break down what the ideal um, mix is within the office. So I'm starting even with the real estate schools. Uh, we have a school here in town that will, you know, if the students opt in, we can correspond with those students and talk about what we offer there. But then I think the next piece of it for those more experienced agents is that kind of a grassroots effort of being involved. So I'm currently serving on our local board of directors. Um, I'm very involved in our affiliate organizations. And so I'm out there and I have conversations with agents. Um, one that I brought on recently was through those connections. Um, I always say that agents are happy where they're at until they're not. And so if you've built those relationships with them and uh, are able to, you know, really focus on, uh, on, on building that, that really helps. Now, the problem that I have also faced without having a system like BrokerKit is, of course, you can only be in so many places at once, right? You've got to run your own business. I, I'm a producing broker, so um, I'm, I'm out there also selling. And so, um, you know, having a, another source of data that you have access to um, and you tie it into a, a CRM like Broker kit, I think, is for me has been the missing component in in growth. Even though, like I said, I had pretty successful growth as a managing broker, taking that next level, I think will will. Uh, I'm excited to see what I can do with using uh, Broker Kit. Okay, and you know, if you leveraged um, you know our solution, or or honestly any other, and you you had kind of the MLS data, the agent production data, you knew who was in those ranges. How, how would you go about reaching out to them if it wasn't via the events to, to kind of bring that scale? How would you go about that? So, so again, I kind of bring it to the, that whole adage of they're happy till they're not. If you can find, um, you know, that agent sweet spot in terms of transaction count, you can focus on those. We have, now we've, we've been declining of late, but, um, uh, 16,000 plus in our market in terms of agent count, uh, MLS wide. And so you want to really narrow and focus. So if you have, um, systemized systems where you can find those using the data and focus on those, those agents that you're looking for specifically, I think that, uh, that's really going to help you leverage that, uh, what that data is all about. Plus there's the ability to really see, you know, agents that maybe, maybe their brokerage office is shut down. Can you capitalize on that right away? Or they've made a major change into their uh, compensation system for their agents. If you have the data already and you have the system in place, you can quickly leverage that and, and you know, get some pretty effective results, I think. Right. Well, and it sounds like timing is, you know, a big part of it, right? Just hitting someone when they've, they've got some kind of pain around their current situation. Um, how do you keep in touch with the people that you say meet at the events you know, or have an initial conversation with, but it's not a great time. Like, how do you how do you keep in touch with them so that they think of you when it is the right time? 
Well, and I think that's the key. That's really the key is that if without a, a, a good system in place, then it is just a matter of when you get around to it, happenstance. Oh, yeah, I remember I meet, met that guy. But if you have a good system in place and you automate it, if let's say they're not currently in your database, get them in that database right away. Put them on a, a campaign to where you are front and center. Um, maybe that wasn't the right time for them right, right then and there, but if they're getting that you know, that slow steady drip of, of uh, what the resources are that are available to them when they do start making that conversation. I think that helps. Another thing is I think that uh, if you have a, have built into your system, you know, those affiliate partners that you work with, lenders, title companies, they their ears are to the ground as well, especially when that change is ready to happen. And they can they can correspond pretty quickly with those agents. Oh, I, I understand you're, you know, you're not happy. Have you thought about this this office? Here's what they offer. And if you have given that information out to those vendor partners, those affiliates, I think that's a really effective way to to um, network as well. Okay. And so once you kind of start that conversation, and it seems like it's maybe the right time, let's talk about how do you how do you move to where you're kind of how do you land them basically? So how do you set the appointment? What does the appointment look like? How do you plan for it? How do you run the appointment um, and what like what's the agenda of that? So, you know, I'm, I'm going to break it down a little bit. If it's a brand new licensee, I set that standard of whether that be a virtual or an in-person. Um, I like to have that in, in an office setting, if at all possible. Uh, I don't necessarily need that to happen for a, a more seasoned agent. But for a brand new licensee, I want that them to, to kind of right off the bat uh, kind of understand you know, what is literally what they're getting themselves into. Um, it's not unlike in this business, uh, you know, coming in and you go to a, a car lot and first thing people do is pounce on you. And so they're giving you that sales presentation. I'm My approach is to be much more about building that relationship with them, getting them to see and feel where the rubber hits the road. This is what our office environment looks like. This is the culture day in and day out. You know, it doesn't matter when you when you step foot in our door. I don't necessarily need that for, to be my initial contact with a, a more seasoned agent. You know, just, hey, can we go to coffee? Can we, you know, can we go to lunch on me? That kind of thing to, to set that up. And then, of course, setting up those reminders. Um, and again, having that system in place where, hey, I didn't I didn't hear back from you. I'd love to, you know, touch base um, now that, uh, you know, you've expressed some interest. And so putting that system together right away and, and getting them into that, um, I think is super important. Um, and then just having that open, honest dialogue, you know, what is it that they're, that, uh, what are the gaps? Listening, finding out what those gaps are. And then frankly, sometimes, you know, what, what you hear and what they express, um, you kind of get a feel for, are they a good fit for you as well? So, and in that one on one on one conversation, I think that helps. Okay. And then, so you mentioned kind of like culture fit being, you know, really important. Do you ever kind of turn people away or just more like don't follow up with them? What happens when you kind of run into someone that feels like it's not a great fit? How, how do you handle that? I mean, obviously, it's a little different than a corporate role where somebody's a W-2 employee, right? Um, you're going to be ultra focused on, <laughs> on how you spend the budget, a uh, little different in an agent role. But how, how do you approach that? Yeah, absolutely. By and large, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. It, it's not a you're turning them away, you're turning your back on them. Just, you know, I, I've even exactly the words you said, I, I, I'm not sure that we would be a good fit for you at this time. Uh, you know, that's the most extreme that I've ever uh, utilized. But, you know, more often than that, it, it's just a, you know, thanks for coming. We appreciate you. And then not doing a whole lot of follow-up um, because, you know, you never know. Their their business uh, mindset may change down the road and, and that relationship may be tied back in. The other thing that's, of course, is that you could very well be on the co-op side of a transaction down the road, right? Mm -hmm. Where in a different you're in a different environment and that. And then so, of course, it is a relationship business. And so, um you, you, that's the, that's usually the, the the how I tread that path if if we know that they're not going to necessarily be a good fit for whatever reason, because there are some times where that that ends up uh, not being the case. That you know they they've kind of changed their mindset. They've you know they've taken advantage of uh, that. And that's the other thing is is that I I always look at it as an education opportunity. I'm um, I was an educator for 20 years before getting into real estate, and so if I feel like there's things that, you know, maybe we can share the resources for them. Maybe that's what the seed that I've planted for them, even though they're not a good fit at this time. And, and they might take advantage of it. And down the road, they would be the perfect fit. So, okay. So then you have somebody that says, yep, I'm, I'm, let's get started. 
what do you do now? Like walk me through kind of the process to kind of close them. And then how do you go about kind of onboarding them? So not that I'm trying to jump through hoops, but uh, I do have, depending on, uh, so for example, I'll use what my experience as a managing broker. Maybe they were looking to be on part of a team. Um, I'm going to make them then take the next step, which is to make sure that they're, so they're a good fit for our office. Let's have you sit down with one of our team leaders. Right, so it's a kind of a multi-step approach. The same thing happens when, if I'm onboarding, um, you know, they're a solo agent or a brand new licensee. Um, I'm always going to say, you know, here's here are the next steps in the process, and I and I go through that with them. Great, you know, we'd love to have you on board. Here's what we're looking for next from you. So kind of a, a, an onboarding system, where I do want to have them. You know, understand that there is there's a set, certain set of criteria and expectations that we have from them, so that number one, something doesn't fall through the cracks, and number two, it is kind of a gauge. Um, I do notice that right around that transition time, whether they're a brand new licensee hanging their license for the first time, or an experienced agent, um, when they they're walking through the door, there's sort of that uh, days and weeks of excitement, and they're, they want to be integrated into this brand new environment that they they're deciding to join, and so we want to fully immerse them as quickly as possible and acclimate them. So I always had a pretty detailed onboarding system where, you know, here's our office manager, here's the paperwork side of it, you know, here's what our expectation is in terms of creating a bio for for our office website. You know, here's getting your head check, all of those systems in place so that we don't lose them, right? It's not just here's sign that paperwork so we can get your license transferred over and then you know, you're an independent contractor. Great. Um, so even to the point of we have set up to where we have certain expectations of in Nevada, for example, they have to get uh, post licensing done within a, in a certain amount of time. It's required within a year for a brand new licensee. That's way too long. If they wait till their 12th month in real estate to take their post licensing, that that does a disservice to the to their clients, their customers, and to our brokerage for that matter. So here's our expectations right off the bat so you know what to, what to do and then follow up with them like crazy to make sure that, you know, within that onboarding period, we've gotten them through the, every step that we need to do. Okay. And you mentioned earlier kind of like steering certain people to team leaders um, to be part of a team. So of the people you're talking to, who, who are the best candidates to kind of, who, who do you typically send to a, a team leader is that next step versus not? So it, it depends. Sometimes a, a new licensee might fit that bill just because they're so inexperienced. They need kind of that structure. Um, part of it, too, the caveat is you've got to have a really good system in place for your teams and your team leaders uh, and understanding who would be a good fit w- for their personality, not just what they're they're looking for a showing agent for for buyers or they're looking for a listing agent but you know what what uh, personality fit would would be best so that's the first step um but then as far as the personality type of that individual you know what is it that they're struggling with what you know take what they've already been successful in and what resources could they use given that you know that little extra push could help them take that next step in their career and, and sometimes a team system is the, the kind of the best form and some will will stay on teams for years right and some will use it as a stepping stone to you know really grow in the business and then kind of step on their own ultimately may, maybe even start their own team and so I, I look at it as what where they're currently at what their needs are uh, what their personality is and the, the personality of that team leader or leaders and how would they be a good fit for them okay and then back to the onboarding, what, what are the, like, how long do you consider the onboarding period? How long does that go before you consider, them? okay, onboarding's done? You know, we're time for, this is where rubber hits the road, basically. Yeah, so uh, again, it's going to depend on who they are. If, if there's a team environment, there's there's kind of an onboarding process for them. If they're a brand new licensee, there's a certain, and then for an experienced agent. So, you know, usually within the first two to three weeks, we've, we've kind of gotten through that onboarding process process. That being said, there might be some additional components, um, some required trainings and things like that, that uh, they need to have completed before they're fully onboarded. And then the other thing is, I think it's also a retention tool, is that if you have kind of annual requirements and things like that, where um, obviously they're independent contractors, but if you say, hey, within this time period, we want to see that you have gone through and refreshed on on certain trainings. Uh, I'll give you an example, fair housing, for example, or DEI. Um, then then I think that's also a retention tool because they, they don't feel like that, okay, here's everything that's at your disposal, take it or leave it. Um, and then 
sometimes you you don't see them again for months until they're ready to pick up their their next uh, commission check. So, right. Okay. And you mentioned retention. Let's let's kind of go there next, right? So, um, retention retaining your agents is is ultimately about them feeling like it's a good fit and being successful, um, which typically comes down to coaching and keeping them engaged. So let's start with the coaching side. And, you know, maybe this is a little different for kind of new versus seasoned agents. And you can answer it differently, right? If you have different kind of cases there. But like what what type of goals do you set with people? Like how do you and what's the process to set those goals? And what are they, you know, around, you know, whether it be production or the leading indicators of that around activity and whatnot? How do you approach that? Yes, there there may be a difference, but I've also found that, uh, again, the vast majority, you know, let's just take a, a CRM, for example. Our association is part of your of your dues. There's a CRM that's provided for you. And we know statistically about 80% don't even use one, right? And so just kind of that bare bones, here's, you know, are you setting yourself up for success in your business? And so it starts, number one, with what is your business plan, even during the recruiting stage? But then on the retention side, okay, that was your business plan. Here's your, you know, for example, I'll use a term, a one, three, five action plan. Where are you? Are you on track? That, that kind of that quarterly check-in, have you met those goals? Uh, if not, what are some resources we can have you, you know, to steer? Uh, I'll steal another, you know, speaking of coaching, uh, uh, something I've heard on a, a lot from a, a, a particular coaching program is spokes on a wheel, right? I'm not going to necessarily tell you what spokes you need to have on your wheel to have a good, decent wheel to get you rolling down the road. But if you don't have three to five that are decent and have a good ROI, you're probably not going to be successful. So if you've done your one, three, five plan, you've got five activities around those three main points of focus for building your business. Are they working? What's your return on investment? What's the system that you're using? And then kind of coaching them on, for example, I'll just give you one example. They, they want to use open house because it's warm leads. Um, what systems are you using? Are you just, you know, hanging some signs out on the, on the street corner and sitting on and doing some work and hoping people show up? Or are you truly engaged in what best business practices are to get some great uh, return on that investment of your time and your money for, for doing open houses, for example? And so I try to check in with them, especially the ones that, again, they're independent brokerages or brokers. They can come and go as they please. But it's that during that peak of silent that I want to hear from them, right? So just check with them. Hey, I haven't heard from you for a while. You know, congratulations on your, your recent escrow. Do you have anything else in the pipeline? I think that really helps. And also the recognition part, in addition to the coaching part offering, hey, can you uh, share with the others in your office that, you know, that success that you had? What was it that you did that helped you stand out from the crowd to, to close that transaction, for example? Um, I also look to recognize even those who aren't, maybe they're not our top producers in our office, but I have a, a vice president of uh, community outreach, right? And she organizes our, you know, th- those kinds of events for our office. She may not be one of our top producers, but she's been with me for a long time, even, you know, moved from the prior brokerage to, to here. Just because, again, just recognize who they are, what their strengths are, and, and being able to build on it. Again, that's where, you know, having a system like BrokerKit, that was sort of the missing link from me before. Um, I kind of relied on, had them on social media, on Facebook. Oh, it's their birthday. I should probably post that out for everybody, right? If you've got that kind of dialed in already and just recognizing them um, and then you know, staying in touch with them and especially noticing trends. If there's their production is falling, we're seeing that a lot right now. Their production is increasing, you know, at any times of moments like that, those could be moments where they might be start to look elsewhere, right? And so if you're there as a resource for them, that helps uh, on the retention side as well. So how do you, how do you go about that? What do you do you know, what's the cadence and how much do you do via kind of group sessions, you know, in the office virtually, you know, versus kind of one-on-ones and how do you kind of structure that cadence so that you have those, you know, those kind of touch points to have those co- coaching conversations? Absolutely. So uh, I'll use, again, because I'm in a smaller office, it's easier to, to be hands-on with a handful of agents, but a mid-sized brokerage with 65, I would use that, that uh, signing date um, in our system that would be kind of my indicator of, you know, when, when I needed to be uh, touching them. So that, in other words, I, 
you can only go around so so much on the individual touches. So uh, I would spread that out based on a quarterly touch minimum for that signing date. And so that would stagger that out. Um, but I do uh, would offer and I do offer um, online or hybrid classes and coaching sessions as well as that, that one-on-one and then group, you know, towards – fourth quarter of the year, it's time to start thinking about building your business plan for the, for the next year and offer that as, as a group. And then if people, for whatever reason, their schedules didn't match, no problem. Uh, let's set up a time where we can do it a little bit more one-on-one. Here's some home- homework to do ahead of time so you're prepared. Bring them in. We have a productive session. And then they feel like they've gotten something out of that. Um, again, that's where if, you, if you've got it set up ahead of time, and it's systematized and it's automated. Uh, it's, you know, I think one of the challenges we get s- spread in so many directions for whatever reason, uh, a, a transaction that's gone south, you've had, you've got to be a resource for one of your agents, things like that. And so if you have it, I always say if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. So if it's already there and it's set up, then it's just part of my, my routine. It's not an, an addition to, being a successful brokerage, it is the meat and potatoes of making sure that it's the engine of my, my brokerage, making sure I've got uh, productive agents. Mm-hmm. The other thing I've heard, you know, there's kind of coaching to coach people, obviously, to production and success, um, driving retention, but also just keeping them engaged. Um, so, you know, tell me your thoughts about, uh, you know, what are the things that you think are important to, you know, for, for you know, brokers to consider as part of their plan to drive that engagement um so they kind of keep their head in the game so to speak um and and stick with you versus keep the head in the game but then jump ship so you know what are your thoughts there absolutely so i i mean i think part of the engagement is letting them really understand what uh, what's happening within the industry and making sure that they are able to be great sources of information the source of the source for their clients and their customers and so being that that uh, resource for them of timely information. Okay, are you ready to make the shift? And here's how, and here's why. Right, uh, being that that source for them, I think is is super important um, because if if they're not doing it independently on their own and they don't know how to get that information, they can be behind the the, the eight ball. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, I also think on on the engagement is just you are leading by example in, in that. I know a lot of brokers um, that. You know, they're kind of penned up in their office, kind of in the daily grind, which is great, but you need to kind of make sure you're involved in your community, make sure you're involved in your industry, make sure you're involved in uh, your association. I think that's really important. And then share that, bring that back to your, to your office level so that they, they see, you know, it's part of a bigger picture. Um, you know, if we, I, I often will share with them the, for example, the 2022 profile bar, buyers and sellers came out from the, from the National Association of Realtors and talked about kind of that median income level, that median transaction count, the median age, all of those things. And then talk about what can you do to differentiate yourself so you're not part of that, just sort of the average, the, the, the day in and day out. How can you set yourself apart, uh, in an industry with, nearly 1.6 million agents. And so I think that's really important to engage them in that, um, you know, whether it be new tech, new trends. And I say that not to, so that you're constantly chasing. It's not the, the tail wagging the dog kind of a thing. Uh, you don't want to be chasing the next shiny object all, of, all the time. On the other hand, you've got to be able to share that and relay that to your agents. And so like when you, when you are talking to prospective agents about potentially joining your brokerage, like how do you position, like what is your value proposition? How do you position it? And how does that align with the, the comp plan that you have? I mean, it seems like that's a big part of it, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, it's, Hey, come over and I'm going to save you all this money that's going to your brokerage or, Hey, come over here and you're going to get all these additional resources. Um, it seems very tightly kind of interwound what your value proposition is typically kind of with the compensation. So how do you, how do you kind of approach that in terms of how the comp plan works? And then how do you, how is that part of your value proposition and how you present it? So it's for me a little bit easier because we're a hundred percent brokerage, a hundred percent model with a transaction fee and a monthly right. office fee. So, so, you know, right off the bat, obviously, I'm never going to chase to zero. Um, there's always going to be somebody that's going to be even a little less in terms of what the, 
the uh, compensation model is. Uh, I'm not going to ever chase that. Here's here's what we offer, and here's what uh, the, the resources are. And so for me, I tie that uh, value proposition to um, how do you become the best agent that you can be, and I'm I'm that that supporting resource for you. I give the example of uh, I was at a national franchise brokerage. Have great connections still to this day with those folks that were there, um, but I tell you what, the first time I had a transaction go south and I reached out to my broker, it took a week for them to get back to me, and so I used that experience that I had to relay that to here's here's what you're getting for you know the bang for the buck. Your return on investment is you do have somebody that is available that's you know actively involved and is is available to you to be a resource for you. So I tie that into. Um, you know, I don't necessarily, again, it's a little different as a, as a hundred percent. I don't have to sell myself on the fact that for X percentage, you're getting this. Now, for those who are on a team and, and that kind of thing, you know, here's why this is the resources. It's kind of like we're providing this ahead of time. And I have that conversation with them. You know, if you are doing these things on your own independently, you're hoping to get some kind of re- return at the end. These resources are being provided for you up front. Those expenses exist whether or not you close or not. The difference being somebody else is outlaying that up front in, in order to get that return of that closed transaction. So, so you can have that conversation uh, in, in both ways. But I really take the approach of that you have to have a broker. You have to hang your license with them. But you, this is your own business. And have you really thought about what it means to be successful within your own business? And and for some, maybe the common denominator, why they're unhappy and they're, they've been constantly looking, isn't what is offered here. It's not offered. It's it's them. And sometimes that's the first time they they have that recognition of, oh wow, I'm I'm. It's always me, whether or not I go here and then this. They say they have this, this, and this for me. And then I go here and it's different set of – it's always me. So I really try to embed, it, embed in them the understanding of you are going to succeed you know, with the resources you have. But ultimately, you, you have to understand what it takes to be successful in business, whatever that business is. Understood. And so it sounds like you were in education before you got into real estate. Um, but since you've been into real estate, you've progressed, right? Starting as an agent, moving on to – uh, managing broker than on the kind of broker owner, um, you know, looking back through through that time and that progression, you know, what are the tips that you would have for your former self to accelerate your path to get there? Like what's, what do you know now that you did not know then? Well, I did make that transition. Um, I, I transitioned from part-time to full-time. And I think uh, the, the number one tip is, is to understand that it is, it is a business um, and to understand what that takes to be successful. Um, there is sort of that, that jumping off point from, you know, no ceiling, no floor. You can make, nobody tells you you can only make so much money, perhaps the federal government, if you get to a certain tax bracket. Other than that, you can make as much money as you want or as little as you want. And so, um, for me, I think that, that tip number one is, is, is if you're starting in the industry part time, don't treat it like a hobby. Don't treat it like, you know, fun money, um, which is great. It's, it's a great, um, source of income if, if you have a full time, you know, wage earning job. But to really treat it like a business, I think I could, even though I, I wasn't doing part time for, for terribly long, um, I could have made that transition even faster. Uh, I think that's number one. Um, I think number two is kind of that concept of the tyranny of the urgent. Um, having systems in place for whatever part of your business right now, for me as a broker, it's broker kit. That's a, a piece that I didn't have. Um, but the tyranny of the urgent always gets in the way, right? It's urgent to somebody else, but it may not be super important for your business. And it may not be super important for making sure that you're doing things that are going to help you continue to generate revenue and grow your business. So I think that's a, another super important concept for, for me that I learned uh, throughout this transition. Um, and then the, the third thing is the, the kind of that key is the follow-up piece. You know, we know that close to 100%, 89%, 90% say when they're done with the transaction, oh, we loved our agent, we're going to use them again. We know statistically it's like 14 to 16% actually do. And so it's that follow-up piece that's the most critical to, to really sustaining your business, no matter what the market condition is. You, you'll you have, you know, a, a great sustainable business for years to come if you're following up with your, your client base and your sphere of influence. Yeah. And I would say by the, by, by the, 
by the way, the same applies to you as a broker owner following up with agents, right? The same math probably exactly uh, applies there too. The fortunes Absolutely. and the follow-up essentially. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, that comes all my questions for you today, Paul. Thanks so much for taking some time to chat with us. Um, where can our listeners find you online? So I am on, uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn. I do have an Instagram account as well. My website is www.achieve relv.com. That's my brokerage website. Well, thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And please do listen in to our next episode to hear about uh, some with some great tips like we just heard from Paul about how you can grow your business today. If you enjoyed our show, please add a rating for us on Apple or Spotify podcasts. And be sure to come back next time to hear more strategies that will help you grow your business. Until then, this is Jim Turner. And don't forget, you need to put some of these tips to work today.